Have you ever felt unsafe inside of something? You know, I'm sure that at some point, all of us have felt that way about a building or a car, maybe even an airplane, maybe it's something else for you. About 20 years ago when I was in college, I went with a group of college students to the Holy Land in Israel. Now, when we first got to the airport in New York to make the flight across the Atlantic, we got on a humongous 747 airplane, one of the biggest airplanes ever built. Now, at that time, it had been the biggest I had ever rode on. And when I got in the plane and I looked around, and then when I got to my seat, let me just say I didn't have the most confidence because when I looked out my window and on the wing, I saw rust stains on the rivets of, that was holding the wing together. And then inside of the plane, it felt like I had stepped back into the 1970s, I'll have to admit, and I was a little bit alarmed. And I can remember just before takeoff, there was a girl that I was friends with in college who sat beside me, behind me, and through the seat, she says, <laughs> she says, I really hope this thing takes off. That's not a, much of a vote of confidence. And I can remember that entire flight praying <laughs> that we would have a safe flight, and obviously it got us there. But you would have thought, in getting on this plane and going over to the Holy Land, that I would have been so excited to go to the place where Jesus had walked. But let me tell you, that whole flight of six plus hours was unsettling, to say the least. You know what? Our security and our safety really does matter to us. If we don't feel safe in the places we dwell, it's hard to thrive when you're always looking over your shoulder or worried the floor might cave in, right? You can't focus on people or personal growth when you are in a scary, unsafe place. We, we just can't do it. And, and so I want, I want to ask you to consider this. I want to encourage you to consider this. Are things well in your life? If not, then ask another question. Where are you dwelling? Perhaps you could be in the wrong place. Maybe you could be in the dwelling of your own pride and your own self-confidence, putting up this facade of strength, which is, which is not really there. Maybe your dwelling is in relationships with other people. Maybe, you are a, maybe you're a people pleaser, and, it, and it's hard. It is really hard to feel love and to be confident, well, when things are not that stable. Maybe it's school, if you're still in school. Maybe it's your friends or your grades, and you dwell in that, and it's, and it's in that that you find your hope. And when those grades just aren't doing very well, things just don't feel that safe. See, it happens to all of us. See, as humans, we were made to dwell. I mean, that's why we build homes, right? It's, it's why when we watch, if you're into watching survivalist shows on TV, what do they usually do first when they go onto a deserted island? They build shelter. There is a security that comes in being sheltered, unless, unless it is in the wrong place. And in many ways, if you think about it, it's much easier to find shelter in the wrong places than in the right ones. And so that begs the question, where is the right place to shelter? A little bit later, we're going to be joined by some of our online church family who are going to read for us John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And after that, we'll kind of dig into this passage and find out where we can find our shelter. Hi, I'm Joey Toomey. And I'm Holly Toomey. Even though we live more than an hour away from Cambridge City, we still consider Cambridge City Christian Church to be our church. We enjoy worshiping with you online each week as we approach our first Christmas together as a married couple. We are glad to be able to join in worship this morning by reading the scripture, which is found in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We are glad we are able to join in the service from the comfort of our home. Have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Wasn't that really neat to meet and hear the reading of the Word of God there in John chapter 1 from a couple of members of our virtual church, Holly and Joey Toomey? You know, we're really excited to have them along with all of those who join us online every week. You know, this week we meet another John. Last week we talked about John the Baptist, and this week we talk about John the Disciple. And we saw last week that John the Baptist came to prepare the way for who we celebrate at Christmas which is obviously Jesus. And last week, we were challenged to be prepared for when Jesus arrives, just like John the Baptist was preparing himself and preparing many others for Jesus' arrival. But today, I want to start by asking where your dwelling place is. That's where we started off with here a little bit ago. Because where our dwelling place is is, is so important for us because so often we can shelter in the worst of places. The John we meet today was the disciple who Jesus loved. That's what the scripture tells us. Now, of course, Jesus loved all of his disciples, but it seems that John was his best friend, the one that he was closest to. So if there is someone who would know Jesus and how he lived and what he said and and what he did, it would be John. He would know. See, John saw him day in and day out. He would know if Jesus really was the son of God or if he was just the son of Joseph or Mary. And his conclusion was that he was not a sinner, that he was truly God's son. And he starts off his account here in John chapter 1, this account of Jesus' life and Jesus' gospel by giving us these 14 verses. Now this passage is loaded with so much that I could really do a 10-week sermon series just on these 14 verses alone. But in verse 1, it starts off by saying this. In verse 1, it says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What powerful verses or verse. So once again, we see the Word in the beginning. God was going to start something new. He was going to bring about a new start to this world and to our lives from from the beginning. See, our sin didn't surprise God. As we saw back in Genesis 1, when we sin, God's love... Uh, was something that would overcome that. He wasn't surprised by our sin, and so we shouldn't be surprised by his love. And then in verses 2 and following, he says, He was with God in the beginning. Jesus was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. See, these few verses point to the eternal nature of Jesus. That he is not created, but rather he is God. And then over the next dozen verses, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time there with you today, John shares his personal experience with Jesus. And then we come to the main verse, the main focus today, which is in verse 14. Here's what it says there in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Like I would said already, John, he had seen Jesus and followed him for over three years. He knew that Jesus was different from everyone else, anyone else that he had ever met. And what amazed John was that Jesus was willing to be among us. Not just to visit us. <laughs> no, he was willing to make his home right here with us. You know, the idea of God becoming human was something that was never even considered by many in Jesus' time. So much so that no one had really ever wrote about it. They knew that a Messiah would come, but they didn't think of the Messiah as being God himself. And, and, and going outside of the Jewish realm, the pagans considered physical things bad. So the idea that the spiritual world would inhabit the physical is, well, it was just impossible for them. 
And the Jews, like I mentioned, they focus so much on the idea that people cannot become God that they never even considered whether God could become a man. See, this was so far outside of their thinking. This idea was so different that there were even large groups of people, even in the early church, who thought that God becoming man, well, it just didn't, it, it couldn't happen. These people were called the Docetists. And the Docetists argued that, it, that Jesus only appeared to be a human. So this is why John and Paul, in, in some of the New Testament letters, uses words again and again and again, pointing to the physical nature of Jesus as God. See, Jesus decided to dwell among us, and he did that by being like us. Now, if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we know that at the beginning, God actually dwelt in this world too. In Genesis 1 and, and 2, it shows us that God walked with Adam and Eve. And that was the way that it was supposed to be from the beginning. And of course, sin changed all that. And it meant that while God was still here, his presence was still here, we could not actually see his presence. We could not physically see him. So in Jesus, God returned. In some ways, I guess you could even say that Jesus' coming was the second coming of God. And he, he knew, Jesus knew that he would have to lay aside his rights and his privileges of God to be able to accomplish the mission of the gospel that would be before, before him. And he knew that he would have to go and die for us. And when God dwelled, when Jesus dwelt among us, he didn't just mean that he was going to come and build a house next door. No, Jesus came to build a house for us to dwell with him. And unfortunately, not everyone then and not everyone today sees the house that he has made for them. And since we all need shelter, what do we do? People build their own houses. Maybe they build their own house of wealth or fame or find dwelling in relationships or knowledge. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about the danger of building the wrong kind of house. He says in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and and they, and they just beat against that house over and over. And what did it do? It fell. And great was the fall of it. Those were Jesus' words. See, we can all build houses. We can all choose our own shelter. But having a shelter does not guarantee it's the right one. See, where we dwell really comes down to what the foundation is built on. And unfortunately, a lot of houses, a lot of dwellings are being built on sand. So how can we dwell better this Christmas? Where can we go in the middle of this storm, this storm that's being unleashed on us here in 2020? Here's something I want you to know today and something I think is so important. I would say it's, it is the point of, of what I'm sharing with you today, and that is this. Things can always be, things are always well, even when the world feels like hell, because Jesus wants to dwell with you. <laughs> you know, unless we live under a rock, we all know that this Christmas is going to be different than any we've ever experienced before. We know that. 2020 has given us a little bit of a glimpse into hell, I guess you could say, right? You know, this week I saw a funny little ornament uh, online the other day. Uh, here's a picture of it for you to see. It's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it shows a picture of, of a dumpster fire with the year 2020 on it. And you can even get them in different colors. You can even find some of them that have flickering lights. <laughs> I think in some ways we can all agree with the sentiment that this ornament's trying to get across. And this is, this is why where we dwell this year might matter more than in any, in any other time in our lives. A lot of people in our world, our community, our families, and our churches, they are just scared. 
They're worried about COVID-19, this disease that is so hard to detect. They're worried about lockdowns that cost jobs. They worry for themselves and for their family and for their friends. Yeah, there's a lot of worry and a lot of places to be scared. And, and so what do we do? We look to go to those places where we can dwell and find safety in. Maybe we avoid the situation that we're in totally by avoiding the news or social media or staying at home. Maybe we dwell in our knowledge of the disease. We find comfort in that home. Maybe you think, I know this or that, and, and in those things that I know, I will dwell. Maybe we say, let's trust the scientists, and that's where I will dwell. Maybe you even say, I will trust my own intuition, and that's the place where I will dwell. You know, I wish we focused on dwelling with God and what that looks like as much as we worry about where to dwell with COVID. Because we've spent a lot of time talking about COVID, and for good reason. We should be safe. We want to be safe. And obviously, I'm not saying that we shouldn't listen to scientists and we shouldn't listen to the news or common sense. Maybe I am saying you shouldn't listen to social media. <laughs> but we should be careful and wise. But our shelter should always be found in Christ alone. And, and John tells us that in this, in this passage. He wants us, I would say, to know that in relation to the Christmas story. And, and here's the thing. We can safely dwell when we dwell in the glory of Jesus. You know, if we've met Jesus, we see what glory looks like. It was him who by the Father gave us his glory, the Shekinah glory that's spoken of in the Old Testament. He has shared with us, Jesus has shared with us who he is, and he has done that by becoming like us. You know, a lot of people in this world, including each of us, you and me, we want to have all the glory, don't we? Now, we've seen it before on teams that we serve. Maybe you've been on a ball team, and when someone gets the winning hit or makes the winning shot, though many others contributed to the victory, what do they do? They take all the glory for themselves. Maybe we've even seen it at work when a boss or a supervisor takes the glory of a massive achievement and takes it away from the employees who help make it happen. You know, our sinful nature is in a desperate pursuit of trying to redeem itself. So what do we want to do? We want to try to create our own glory. But Jesus showed us something different. Jesus took his glory, the real glory that's there, and showed it to us and gave it for us. He, he took the glory and died on a cross for us. He took the glory and was born in a stable and laid in a manger to dwell with us. So that's where the glory lies. See, don't find your shelter don't find, your shelter in a sh don't find your shelter in a place you have created for yourself. No. Find shelter and dwell in those places where there is less of you and more of him. Do it by serving others in a food pantry, volunteering at school when that time comes. I know it's a little hard to do that now. Giving to others who need help. I really think that God chose what was a backwater, what, which really was an insignificant place in the world at the time of Jesus, he chose that place for a reason. He didn't want to bring glory to himself, but rather he wanted to share his glory with us. You know, another place that we can safely dwell in is that we can safely dwell, dwell in the truth of who Jesus is. You know what? No one likes to be lied to. Yet it seems everywhere we go, we just cannot trust anyone, can we? I mean, the news, social media, sometimes even our family and our friends, it can be really hard to know who to trust. Yet so many people are dwelling with people who let them down. We've all done it. We've all been there. We've trusted in the wrong person and went the wrong way. We put our shelter in the wrong place. And, and I want to ask you to consider escaping whatever seeming hell that maybe you are experiencing in right now to instead dwell in God's truth. You know, I really believe a lot of the mess that we are in is because we are too bu busy building our own towers of truth. And then what happens is they collapse. And then what do we do? We go out and we build another one of our own doing and another one and another one. How are you doing that? See, Jesus is the truth. And it's in him that we find stability. Maybe so many of us do not feel safe 
because, well, we don't live on a house built on the rock, but we've built one on the sand. You know, we think that we can find freedom by creating our own truth even, when in reality, by creating our truth, our own truth, it enslaves us. Jesus came to give us the truth to do what? It says in John 8, 2, he gave us the truth to set us free. Find freedom in his words and safety in dwelling with him. And we can also find safety when we dwell in the grace of Jesus. What wonderful grace he has. You know, this Christmas, many receive and give gifts. And we, we usually do that for a, for a, a, a reason, right? We, we give it because we love a person. We give it because we want to help a person. But God gave us his grace not because we deserved it, but because of his love. And too often, what do we do is, is, is that too many of us, we dwell in ourselves and we dwell in our abilities. And what do we do? We always fail ourselves. But the grace of Jesus gives us the safety that we need in this world to know that we can mess up and get another chance. Isn't there a great security in that? Isn't that amazing? And, and there's something... If you think about it, there's something that's so beautiful with this. While this world is about getting ahead, Jesus put himself behind to get us ahead, to give us a chance. We've dwelled for way too long in places that won't last and in places that are not safe. Dwelling with Jesus is the safest place to be. And so here's my challenge for you this week. And this one is a big one, all right? And hang with me here. I want to challenge you to move out of your house. <laughs> now, before you get worried and you feel like you have to go out and get a realtor or go buy a for sale sign, just hear me out here. I, I'm not talking about where you live, and that's good because we're here in my house this week, and my wife, listening to my message, she might be getting a little nervous. She's like, uh-oh, is Danny getting ready to put the house up for sale? No, that's, that's not what I mean, okay? Hang with me here. I want to invite you to take stock of where the address is to your heart. Maybe the address belongs to yourself. Maybe it's one myself way. Or maybe it's your spouse at two Lovebird Lane. Or maybe it's your kids at three Munchkin Street. <laughs> or maybe your home address is not even a person. Maybe you dwell in your work at four Career Trace. Or it's a sport at 5 Legends Avenue. I think you get my point, right? <laughs> Where is your address? You might need to move. All of us have an address that is different. <laughs> All of us have an address that is different from our street address. It's the place where our heart resides. And if that heart is dwelling in Jesus, if it's not, you need to move out. Because see, here's the thing. Where you dwell says a lot about whether things are well. Let me say that again. Where you dwell says a lot about whether things are well. Each Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus decided to change his address to be with us. He gave up all of heaven, all that heaven had to offer, and came amongst us in a dirty stable filled with people living, living broken lives and decided that to be here was the place that he wanted to be the most and that we needed him to be the most. And how about you? Are things not well? Maybe it has, it has little to do with what has happened or who has done whatever to you, but more about well, where you dwell. Is it in yourself, your abilities, your pride? Or are you dwelling and living and is your life about following the one? You know, one of my favorite Christmas greeting cards is one that I heard about many years ago. It describes the birth of Jesus in a nutshell. When, when you look at the printed greeting on the inside of the card, it simply said this, He became what we are so we could become what He is. Isn't that great? God has come through Jesus to dwell among us, to make us more and more, more like He is. So my question for you is, will you dwell with Him there? Will you dwell with Jesus there? Will you move to a new address? There was a young man who was constantly quarreling with his dad. 
And after many years, he finally left home and he never even said goodbye to his dad. Now, he continued to keep in touch with his mom, but he cut off every communication possible with his father. He would not speak to him and he would have nothing to do with him. Well, after a few years, he wanted to come home for Christmas. He wanted to come home so bad, but he was afraid that his dad wouldn't allow it after what had happened those previous years. So his mom wrote to him and urged him to come home. And inside he felt that he, he just couldn't do that until he knew that his father had forgiven him. And they wrote back and forth, he and his mom, a few times about it. And he wondered and he waited, should I go? Should I go this Christmas? Well, finally, there wasn't any more time. It was getting close to Christmas. No more time for letters. No more time for emails, texts. So his mother wrote him and said that she would talk to his, to his father. And if he had forgiven him, that she, what she would do is she would tie a white rag on the tree right next to the railroad tracks that were near their house in their backyard. And when he come up on the train, he would be able to see the tree before the train reached the station. And if there were no rag on the tree, then his son would know that it wouldn't be good to come. And he would just stay on the train and go on by. Well, the young man, he got on the train and he started for home. And, and as the train got closer and closer to his house, he became so nervous, he couldn't look out the window. He had brought a friend along with him. And, and he said to his friend who was sitting next to him, he says, I just, I can't look. I can't see it. Uh, would you just sit in my place and look out the window for that big tree in my backyard next to the tracks and tell me, tell me if there's a rag on it or not. So they get closer and they get closer and the anticipation builds. And his friend trades places with him and he looks out the window. And after a while, the friend says, he says, oh, I, I, I think I can see the tree. I see the tree. And the anticipation builds and, and he's wondering. The son asks his friend, is there a white rag that is tied to the tree? Is, is there a white rag tied there? In an almost desperate plea. For a moment, his friend didn't say anything. And then he turned and I saw a voice. He told his friend, he told the son, there's a white rag tied to every limb of that tree. What a cool story. And that is where we should live. We should live in a home that is filled with limbs, waving white flags, waiting for us to come home to be forgiven. And let's find that place with Jesus this Christmas. And let's dwell with him there.